I was diagnosed with a stage three uh, tumor in my left leg. Uh, after much research, I learned that it uh, very likely uh, was caused by my laptop, which I kept on my left leg for hours upon hours at a time. Uh, it affected me in many ways as a runner. Uh, and then I, as a result of the information that I found, uh, I learned that it is not only the laptops, it is the mobile devices. And my mission is to create awareness so that this doesn't happen to anyone ever again. And to protect our children. So I went on the, I Googled the owner's manual for my laptop. And what it says is, uh, if your screen is larger than 12 inches, which it is, which is actually the laptop I'm using right now, but you can be assured it's not on my leg, my leg or my lap, it says to keep it a minimum of eight inches away from your body. This is my laptop. My laptop. You keep it on your lap. You know, um, never anywhere did I see on the box or on the laptop itself, do not put this on your lap. That's what really angered me. Um, and I, I can tell you, it was every day. It was every day, at least an hour a day. At least an hour a day. And my first reaction, um, I was so angry. I was so angry. Um, you know, as I said, running was my passion. And that was taken from me. I, I often would run... And sometimes after my sister Sue passed, a few times, I, I would run while I was crying. It was therapeutic. It was cathartic. I was diagnosed in November of 2016 uh, with a stage 3 undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. That's a mouthful. Um, really quite by accident. Um, I'm very active. I was a runner. I rollerbladed, I paddleboard, and I had always had back problems, but that summer uh, I had gone mountain biking for the first time uh, in Killington, Vermont. And it was a lot of fun, but it uh, was like being on a roller coaster on a bicycle. And I remember like holding on for dear life. And as a result, I had some really bad muscle spasms. So I decided to. Uh, you know, go to the orthopedic. I had tried acupuncture, which did was helpful, but it, it was bad. So I went to the orthopedic doctor and uh, told him about my neck and my, my back. I was a runner. And uh, he literally was walking out of the office. And I said, hey, wait a minute. Uh, you know what? I have this swelling. I think I have a lump in my legs, probably nothing. But can you just take a look at it? And he asked if I was in an accident. He asked if I was in a car accident, if I fell down. No, no. So fortunately, he listened to me. Uh, and he sent me for an MRI and uh, sent me back for another one with contrast. And then I got the phone call that I needed to see an oncologist. Now, this happened three years after I lost my twin sister to cancer. Um, she was diagnosed in August of 2013. She passed in November of 2013. So um, I was still acclimating to life without my twin. Um, we were very, very close. So naturally, you can imagine, I, actually, I was in the hospital three years to the day that she passed in a hospital mm. bed with my own diagnosis. Mm. Um, so they removed most of my thigh, my left thigh, uh, and I began uh, grueling physical therapy and uh, 35 rounds of radiation treatment on my leg. Mm. Um, I went back to work, uh, having to go every three months for my quarterly scans. Um, and I can't say exactly when, but I remember having an epiphany because you always wonder how, how did this happen? If, if it was, you know, 
lung cancer, you know, you quit smoking, or if you have high blood pressure, you know, you, you watch your salt intake or whatever. And I started doing, trying to do research about it, and I started finding things about radiation. And the more I dug deeper, I realized that I don't know 100%, but my oncologist says it's very possible that the very laptop that I used for hours at a time on my left thigh, I would often sit at home uh, working with my laptop on my left thigh, uh, usually working from home or even playing Candy Crush or whatever. Um, and that's where the tumor was formed where I kept the laptop and I, I can tell you it was every day. It was every day, at least an hour a day, at least an hour a day. And my first reaction, um, I was so angry. I was so angry. Um, you know, as I said, running was my passion and that was taken from me. I, I often would run and sometimes after my sister Sue passed a few times, I, I would run while I was crying. It was therapeutic, it was cathartic. Um, and it was taken from me. Um, I, I ran, you can see this, I ran the New Jersey half marathon. I love this picture because it epitomizes my strong spirit, mm -hmm. uh, my fighter spirit. And I got angry and emotional. And then all of a sudden, oh my God, I thought, oh my God, what about the kids? Um, I have grandchildren, and I remember my, my son and daughter-in-law giving my grandson an iPad for his birthday, and at the time, I was like, oh, that's great. And then when I was doing this research, and I found all this information, I, it, it just it so upset me and really forced me on this journey of learning more about uh, mobile device radiation and creating awareness. Uh, I always say you wouldn't give a kid a cigarette uh, and as far as the cell phones, I remember when they first came out, there were so many warnings, you know, they cause brain cancer and they could cause ear cancer and everybody was so, you know, nervous about it in the, in the 90s when they came out and then it just kind of faded away. Nobody really thought about it anymore. It kind of just disappeared, the warnings. Um, and my feeling is, if they can put warnings on cigarette packs, why can't they do that for these devices? I, I did a lot of research and I've learned on my own, I did my own research how uh, cell phones tell you, do not keep these, put them on speakerphone, do not let them touch your body. Uh, the FDA recommends using a landline when possible. I, I started finding information on the World Health Organization's website, the National Institute of Health, even the New Jersey Education Association, all of these organizations. And as I'm finding this out, I'm just blown away by it. And then I learned that really an iPad is just a, a big cell phone. Um, so my thought is, you know, whatever happens to me happens. Um, I've been doing well. I go for my quarterly scans and this November would have been my two year mark. And at two years, I, I was told, you know, if you're clean, you're good, you won't have to do this again for six months. And I went in for my, my uh, two year scan, my quarterly scan, which fell on the two year anniversary. And I really was, for the first time, confident. I left the radiology place saying, hey, I'll see you guys in six months, it's two years, I'm good. Um, and then I got the call last week um, that it's, it came back, um, which they said it would. I had gone to Sloan Kettering in New York two years ago for a second opinion. And they told me this type of cancer, uh, if it does spread, it will go to your lungs and it will be very aggressive. And it was aggressive in my leg. It grew so quickly. It was the size of a softball. Uh, I mean, it grew like within a matter of maybe eight weeks. And, and I even remember clearly one night, I couldn't sleep. I was in so much pain in my leg. And I looked and I could see the veins popping out on the side of my thigh from the pressure of the tumor. So right now, um, I'm going to have surgery this coming Monday, December 10th, 2018, um, to have the, uh, the tumor removed from my left lung. We, we don't know what my prognosis is yet.
I am determined to fight this. I'm not giving in. Uh, my motto is I won't back down. Uh, that's always been my motto, the Tom Petty song. Uh, you know, never give up. But I feel more compelled now than ever to really spread the word. And I do this. I don't want to create hysteria. I don't want people to think I'm, I'm you know, trying to tell them, no, never use your cell phone or iPad. We know that's not going to happen. Happen. We, we all use these devices. Uh, I just want to create awareness on how to use them wisely. And my feeling is, hey, if you're an adult and you want to take that chance of, of putting the cell phone, you know, keeping it on in your pocket or some women keep it in their bras, that's up to you. However, our children rely on us uh, to do what's best for them. They know that they're safe. They know that mommy and daddy can, will take care of them. And I feel that as a parent or as an aunt or an uncle, just as an adult, a teacher, I feel that it is our responsibility to create awareness, awareness and protect our children. Uh, if they're adults and they want to play with the iPad and keep it on their lap all the time, then they can make that decision as an educated adult. But as a child, we need to protect them. And I'm coming across, I, I make it a point whenever I come into contact with someone that I know that has small children, I always say, hey, and I tell them, you know, just be on the safe side, download the content, put it on airplane mode. And when I tell them my story and I tell them about the research, everybody is like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think of that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my mission. That is, this is my mission now to create awareness, not hysteria, but just awareness. You know what? I had an epiphany. I, I can't explain it. Uh, I just, I, I remember I was going to bed, saying my prayers. I always, I'm always thankful. I always thank God for everything. And um, I remember that night I, I was thinking about my grandson, Parker, getting his iPad. And I always kept thinking, you know, how did this happen? And, and I had read, I had done some research and I had read that, you know, could be caused by radiation. And for the life of me, I, I couldn't figure out, I, I never had gotten MRIs or x-rays, I was never exposed to anything like that, I, you know, I don't work in a nuclear power plant. Uh, and then I started doing research and one of the things that floored me that I found recently and still upsets me, um, you know, all of these, these phones and these electronic devices now, we used to have owner's manuals back in the day. Uh, and some of them do come with owner's manual, but a lot of the information is, you know, go to our website. So I went on the, I Googled the owner's manual for my laptop. And what it says is, uh, if your screen is larger than 12 inches, which it is, which is actually the laptop I'm using right now, but you can be assured it's not on my lag, my leg or my lap. It says to keep it a minimum of eight inches away from your body. This is my laptop. My laptop. You keep it on your lap. You know, um, never anywhere did I see on the box or on the laptop itself, do not put this on your lap. That's what really angered me. Um, I'm sorry, I don't want to get emotional. I, I, so I don't know. Unless you're a runner, I, I don't know if you, if you can truly understand how much running was a part of my life. Um, I would go out in like sub-zero weather with wind chill, just bundled up, bundled up layer after layer. I ran, I just, it was good. It cleared my head. It was good physically. Um, you know, I always took care of myself. I always, I always worked out. Um, and that was taken from me. And, and even when I ran that half mi marathon, I trained for that. It, it's not something you do overnight, but uh, it was something I really, it was a passion of mine. It was truly a passion of mine. And uh, I, that's how I found out. And it really, really brought me to my knees. And then, as I said, I, I, then I started thinking, oh my God, wait a minute. And then, you know, thing, you know, one thing led to another, and um, that's how I, you know, started. And I didn't start telling people 
you know, hey, this may be until I really did a lot of research. And I remember that night, as I told you, when I was saying my prayers and it kind of, I was like, oh my God, I had a, an aha moment. Uh, I got up really early that morning and just started looking up, the, up things. And mm -hmm. it's hard because I, I, I you know, I, I do work full time, although I'm going to be out on a medical leave because of this. And um, I have an elderly mom who I'm a caregiver for. So, you know, time is limited, plus my physical therapy and, and all of that. But I always try to carve some time to, to do more research. Um, and, and that's how I found out. My goal is just to create awareness. Like I said, I, I don't want to uh, create hysteria. I just want people to be educated and then they can do with that information what they will. But my only hope is that when it comes to their children, it's why take a chance? Just it's just not worth it. You, you, you as I said, you wouldn't give a child a cigarette. Uh, our government puts warnings on cigarette packs. My goal, hopefully, is that this awareness will create momentum. And I am not the only one that has spoken on this subject. Um, I'm hoping that this awareness will continue to snowball and create more awareness. I'm, I'm hearing things, you see things here and there, and I, and I saw a newscaster recently that was talking about how he went for a whole weekend without having a cell phone, and at first it was difficult, and then he really enjoyed it. Again, I'm not saying stop using your cell phone. I'm not expecting people to do that. I just want people to be aware. Um, we don't know all the facts. We do know a lot. Um, and I, I just want people to be aware. I love life. I, I love having a full life. Um, I, you know, like I said, I used to run and rollerblade. I volunteer with Habitat for Humanity. I, I've always been very involved and, uh, I always prayed, you know, please give me an opportunity to help others. Please help me to make a difference. And sometimes you don't know what your calling is. And now I feel that um, maybe this happened for a reason to me. I don't know. Um, what I do know is um, if this had to happen, but if I can prevent one other person, even if it's just one other person, um, from going through the, this, this cancer journey, then this will not have been in vain. Cancer sucks. Um, I've been through it too many times. My, my sister was a volunteer after 9-11 and she passed from lung cancer within three months. M my dad uh, was a World War II veteran. Um, also environmental factors. He, uh, he, he had a very small gas station in, in Union City, New Jersey and mm. he was a mechanic and uh, the doctor said it was probably the asbestos and the brakes and the lead from the gas. So, you know, environmental has uh, factors have made a, a big impact on my family. Um, but as I said, um, it's the children. I don't want any children to be exposed to this. I, I just want to protect the children and, and, and other people so that other people can make an educated decision. What do you think that parents need to know? Like if you could summarize what parents need to know, how would you, what would you say to parents? Um, you know, we, for the most part, you know, parents always want to do what's best for their children. We want to educate them uh, with books and, you know, the educational games or, or things to educate them um, and we always wanted we always want to do more for our kids or give more to our children than we had not that what we had even though we had we didn't have all the things kids today have um, my sister and I could have fun just playing with a box but uh, you know parents always want to do more and 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 uh, you know provide the one message that I would have and I think the scary message is you know as a parent you think you're doing something great by you know hey you know here's your here's your ipad and let, let's download you know national geographic or whatever educational games um 
and my they're thinking they're doing a good thing so my, my advice to them would be of course let them if, if you want them to do that my first honestly I'm gonna say is give them a book uh, like we used to have um, but if you're gonna let them use the iPad just be smart don't let them put it on their laps it, it kills me I matter of fact I was at the hospital this week for my pre-op tests and I see a little girl in her stroller I, I'm going to say she was maybe three years old with her, her big iPad in her lap as her, as her mom was pushing her down the hallway. And then they called me in and it took everything for me not to, well, I can't run anymore, but it took everything for me to try not to barrel down that hall and say, hey. So my suggestion is you is by all means do not let them put it on their body. We, you know, we've had these around for I guess 20 years now. Some of us have been using them maybe 10, 15 years. At, you know, starting out at, as young adults, these kids are starting out as little as one years old, one year old, uh, using these devices, which is so much earlier than we ever started using cell phones. Um, so my advice is, you know, keep it away from their body, and put it on airplane mode. Uh, you know, you go out for dinner. I'm sure you can you can. Uh, attest to this it's very often you go out for dinner and you see families together having dinner and you see you know the, the little ones playing on their iPads because they're, they're bored or whatever um, and my suggestion is just put it on the table uh, I, I have a friend at work I was telling her about all this and she was like okay well Michael puts it on a pillow no 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 pillows radiation pillow is nothing it's not going to stop the radiation from permeating that. Um, so, again, put it on your desk. You know, if you're going to use your laptop, which, like I said, I right now I have it on a platform. I will never ever um, put it on my body again. The, the sad part is, is when I was recuperating uh, after my cancer in my thigh, um, I would lay on the couch. Mm -hmm. Again, with my laptop on my chest, on a pillow, on my chest, uh, mm. yeah, uh, on my chest, because I didn't know. Uh, now I, I do. Right here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right here. Right on my, right on my lungs. I would lay down. I mean, I was, I was incapacitated. I was out of work uh, for five and a half months. And, and when I tell you that the physical therapy was grueling, it was. And uh, I'm, I'm going to let people know, can cancer sucks. It's not pretty. Um, you know, the, the, the radiation, and I'm not trying to scare people about the, the treatments, but it, it, it wasn't fun. Um, you know, and I spent a lot of time, and, and I'm somebody that's, I have so much energy, and, you know, I'm always doing everything, you know, running here, there. Uh, so to be on the couch for five and a half months uh, was, you know, tough. So there's... You know, I, I only so much reading and crocheting that you could do, but I did. I, I kept the, the, the laptop. Uh, I would, you know, I would go online. I would, you know, uh, you know, ch read things online. And, you know, I never thought about it. Play my, you know, games or whatever online just to kill the time. Uh, and I spent most of my recovery time with, with this, this computer on my chest. Hmm. So my, to answer your question in a nutshell, uh, keep it off of their bodies, airplane mode. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, I went to the gym. I, you know, you, everybody has an armband. Boom, airplane mode. Just put it on airplane mode. It's, it's simple. It's not hard. Just go to your settings, and, and you just slide it over, and there you go. You can't get phone calls when it's on airplane mode. Um, but, uh, I mean, unless you're expecting an urgent phone call, and I, you know, women, at least we have bags that we can carry these devices and our cell phones and men always put them in their pockets. Uh, you know, so unfortunately for them, it's not as easy. Uh, but for, for men, I'm going to say, hey, if you have a duffel bag or, you know, some kind of a gym bag, you could stick it in there or just put it on airplane mode if you're going to keep it in your pocket. That's that's my advice. Airplane mode. That's my new word. My, my new logo, airplane mode. That's it. So, um, tell me about your sister. Hmm. 
Uh, okay, well, I guess you can see if there's a couple of pictures of me and her. There's a drawing behind me, a sketch that a friend of mine from high school did before he went to uh, um, college in California. And then there's a picture underneath it of her and I together. Uh, yeah. We were the best of friends. Um, you know, we grew up together and growing up, they didn't separate us. So we went through like all through grammar school in the same class together. Uh, high school, we were in the same homeroom, but we, we shared some classes. Uh, our children, my, my second son, Rich, and her daughter, Alicia, were only four months apart. So we were moms together. Uh, we even used to work for the same company, and we lived across the street from each other. A little bit. Oh, older. wow. <laughs> uh, we had a great rapport. Uh, she, when we lost our dad, in 1996 like we just leaned on each other we we always i mean we always knew what each other were thinking we were fraternal um this is susie uh beautiful she's mm -hmm. beautiful inside and out um susie wore many hats she worked in construction uh she did telemarketing she was a dental assistant and uh the last career uh path that she uh, took was uh, as a massage therapist. Susie always wanted to help others. Um, so she became a massage therapist and she would go to Payne Weber or uh, PSENG, which is our uh, gas and electric company. She would go to corporations and, you know, bring her table there and uh, mm. give massages there. Um, and then 9-11 happened and we, I live very close to New York City uh, um, and we all wanted, we all felt the calling to do something to help. Um, I remember running down to donate and at that time they weren't even taking blood donations because of what was going on. But anyway, um, so after 9-11 there was a place called the Arthur Kill, I'm not sure why it's called the Arthur Kill, but there's a place called the Arthur Kill in Staten Island, New York. Uh, it's a garbage dump and it is where they brought all of the rubble. It's where they brought the rubble from uh, the towers and they had to painfully sift through it for oh. human remains and, and so forth. So I don't, I don't remember how Susie got the call. It may have been from the school where she had uh, gotten certified as a massage therapist. They were looking for volunteers to go to the Arthur Kill the workers that were were sifting through the rubble. It, it was it was a horrible time. These people. It was a very emotional time. Mm -hmm. um, so they were trying to do whatever they could to to give relief to to these workers. So Susie would go there every work, every week, like clockwork, um, at least once a week. Bring her massage table. They had a tent set up, um, and 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 she and and the others would go there and. Uh, volunteer and provide, you know, chair massages. And she would talk to them and, you know, they, they all, they bonded. Um, that was, you know, 2001, 2002. Um, and then in 2013, uh, in August, I remember it vividly, uh, it was uh, August uh, 24th. I remember that because it was my, my younger son, Rich's birthday. We got the call. Um, she had been having, having some uh, stomach problems. She had a lump and she had gone and we found out that uh, she had cancer. So, you know, we digested it and I remember that weekend I, I went to go visit her and she was not feeling well at all and the doctor said, you know, come to the emergency room. So I brought her and they did tests and uh, the doctor showed me her scans and he could not fathom how this happened. Uh, my sister did smoke. I, I, I'm not going to deny that, but not a lot. She, you know, she did smoke socially. She wasn't a big smoker. And even with that, the doc, and I had told, he knew this, her pathologist, her, her oncologist. Um, he had never seen anything like this. And he showed me, and they were just, her, her liver and her lungs, they were just, it was just too many to count the tumors mm. he told me she had six weeks he told me she had six weeks so i had to um had to tell her that uh and quite honestly she took it better than i expected i you know i really kind of fell apart um 
she was strong and uh, you know she digested it and um, they gave her chemo to keep her comfortable because uh, the cancer spread from her lungs to her liver and when it goes to your liver you're you kind of look like you're pregnant she uh, her stomach got very big so they did that as a palliative effort to keep her comfortable and help her the tumors in her liver to go down somewhat um, and, and we did that up until our, our birthday I remember it clearly uh, September 20th is our birthday or was our is our birthday she's still my twin um, and she was just so sick that it was it was enough with the chemo and then she passed on November 20th she fought she was a survivor and you know we're, we come from strong stock we're part Sicilian um, she was she was coherent uh, right up until a few hours before she passed and mm -hmm. I will say this uh, you know we were surrounded by her my niece her daughter um, uh, had been living in Florida um, and was staying with her dad my sister was divorced uh, and I remember calling up my brother-in-law and saying it's time you, you have to bring a leash it's time and my sister hang hung on until Alicia walked in the room and as soon as Alicia walked in the room she said mom I'm here and she kissed her and my sister smiled and that was it that was her last breath so um, you know it was tough when uh, when she when she was passing we had a lot of time to talk and uh, you know really talk about things and I remember at one time I told her I just I couldn't imagine living without her um, and she told me well you have to keep our stories going you have to tell my grandbabies about me and I, I promised her I would do that and uh, I do I, I I, I have a video. It's it's very uh, it's very amateur uh, because I'm not a video technician. But for our last birthday, I had no idea what to give her, uh, so I made a video, put to music, of pictures of us from babies until adulthood, and that was my last gift to her. And, and we we played that at her funeral, and um, you know I I know she's with me. I feel I she gives me signs. She gives me signs. Uh, um, but you know she we we didn't realize that it could have been from 9-11 from her volunteering uh, until we had to call hospice and and there were two hospice nurses and they were working with someone else who also had been there uh, after 9-11 and my sister said you know they would hose down my car but they never made me wear a mask uh, and that that said a lot um, and again you know at the time uh, they put out you know oh air quality is fine air quality is fine down here the EPA it's good we don't have anything to worry about and uh, you know she's gone now uh, you know there's nothing we can do about it uh, but you know I, I truly believe it was um, her good heart wanting to help others, you know, um, you know it, it may have cost her her life. And there are still so many people now, you know, they're saying if you develop cancer, I just heard it on the radio yesterday because there's all of these things that you hear about it. And they say if, if you were exposed to it, you know, uh, within 12 years after it had happened, um, it more than likely was caused from that. And, and I really, uh, I'm very sure I don't have clinical evidence because she's gone we can't do that uh, type of testing on her but because of how aggressive it was um, even her doctors believed that absolutely that absolutely could have been the uh, contributing factor and my sister was beautiful inside and out taken way before her time she was only 49 you have to realize they're sifting through all of this rubble they're they're sift they were sifting through it for remains uh, you know whatever they could find so of course it, it, it was a dusty environment and she did they would hose down her car she would tell and I 
we never thought about it. We never, I, like in hindsight now, it's like, hmm, if, if it's on your car and they're not allowing you to leave the, the area, you know, transporting that dust, how did we not, you know, I don't know, how did we not realize that uh, then, you know, but yeah, that's, that's, I remember it clearly. I remember it clear. I remember her telling me that at the time. And then when she reiterated it, when we were speaking with uh, the hospice nurse, I was like, oh my gosh, you're at, I forgot all about that. When I went for my last scan, it was November 20th. Uh, and it, November 20th was the day she passed. And it was exactly five years on her anniversary that I went for my scan. Uh, here I am. So, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm not here. It's not like, oh, poor me. Uh, I, I'm just determined. I am going to keep plugging along for as long as I can, hopefully for a long time. Uh, and you know, the, the other thing is I've been wanting for a long time to, to really get this out instead of just, you know, telling people as I see them on the street or, you know, see them at family or functions or gatherings. Um, it, it wasn't until recently that I decided to get this message out and I started doing more. I, I recently applied to do a, a TEDx talk. Mm. And then when I got this diagnosis and I, I've only known this, uh, I only met with the surgeon this a week ago today, actually. Um, I knew, okay, now's the time. You, you have to do this. You have to do this. You can't just keep this to yourself. You know, part of me, I kept it to myself somewhat because I didn't want people to think I was crazy or just to discount her like, oh, there's another, you know, person that doesn't know what she's speaking about. So I really was very careful uh, in doing as much research as I could before you know speaking about this um and when i got the diagnosis that it's it's a stage four that it metastasized i knew okay you have to get the word out this is this is your purpose now and um as i said if 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 one person just one person is able to take something away from this and change their lifestyle that's it that's all i could ask for then I can leave here and know, hey, it wasn't in vain. I, I, I helped others. And, uh, you know, I, that's, I think it's in my genes. Um, my sister volunteered. My mother, after my dad passed, would volunteer at a soup kitchen in Jersey City. Uh, she literally would make huge pots of soup and, and bring them uh, to the soup kitchen and, and bring them socks and gloves. My dad... Uh, was really involved with uh, he he belonged to the uh, the benevolent protective order of elks. He was uh, an exalted ruler, kind of the grand poobah, and he was involved in helping the needy. And uh, at the time, they used to call it uh, crippled children. They would help children that were disabled and you know have fundraisers. So it's in my genes, uh, you know, wanting to give back. And um, this is my way of of trying to give back, so to speak, and, and, and help others by making them aware. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I truly am grateful for the opportunity uh, to speak here uh, and for, for creating awareness. And, and I really, uh, I just, if I could say one thing, uh, even if you don't believe me, but if you have a little, little bit of doubt, yeah, just, you know what? Or on the side of caution and, uh, you know, be safe. Use, use the devices. We all use them. Not going away, but just be safe. And, and, and that's all that I, I can ask for. It's just, you know, awareness and um, not hysteria, just awareness and uh, just be smart about it. Really wish, um, you know, I really wish that this awareness goes viral. That's what I want. I want this awareness to go viral. Uh, and I'm hoping, you know, there are, 
I'm hoping that the millennials of this world, the millennial generation is a very powerful generation. They don't accept the status quo. Um, my hope is that this awareness will go viral, that they will take this and really heed the warnings that, that I'm talking about and that other organizations are talking about and really take it to heart and, and spread the word and that if nothing else, if absolutely nothing else, that parents will protect their children. That's, that is my, my, my goal. I do, not, I do not want children to be exposed to this. They trust us, they rely on us. So my, my goal is that uh, whether it's in life or death, that my story will inspire others to um, to spread the word and not be afraid, not be afraid that people are going to think they're crazy. Uh, my goal is that even after I'm gone, I want people to to know my story. I want people to know Susie's story too, because I promised her I'd keep it going. Um, never give up. Never ever give up. Never back down. And you know, as I said. Early on, my motto is I won't back down, and that applies in many ways. I, I'm not backing down to this cancer. I'm not giving up yet, but it's also I will not back down in regard to spreading this word. If I believe in something, I will tell the masses, uh, and that is my intention. I will, with every last breath that I have, I will spread this word just to keep people safe. Some people say to me that, oh, it's everywhere. There's, there's nothing we can do. I, this is too big for me. What do you say to people who say there's, there's nothing that you can do? It's not too big. Look, it's, look, it's not that. It, it, is, it is a big deal, but it's, it's simple. It's just about being smart. It's just about being smart. Don't put your phone in your bra. Uh, I put it on, if I'm going to use my cell phone, I put it on speakerphone. Are there times where you can't hear it? Yeah, of course. And I'm, I'm of course, there are times, of course, I, I, I use it the way you're not supposed to up against your head. Um, but it's, it's not that hard. If I know that, as I said, if I'm going to wear it in my armband, you know, if I'm at the gym, I, I put it on, in airplane mode. It's simple. Airplane mode. It's that easy. Or turn it off. It, it, so it's really not that hard. It's just it's just a slide of the device. And if you people don't believe me, all they have to do is they can look at the legal disclaimer, which is online for their cell phone. Uh, it, it's 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 fairly easy to to find this information. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry, it's not that easy. It's pretty <laughs> elusive, actually. I apologize. I take that back. <laughs> It's not easy to find this information. I had to dig deep. I had to dig really deep to and really scroll through all of the uh, information in the owner's manual for my laptop where I found on page 11, keep this eight inches away from your body. So yes, these warnings are elusive. And with everything else, you know, people may see something, but who really reads all of these things? Nobody really does. Nobody pays attention to, to, to the warnings. So my advice is, if you don't believe me, look it up. You can, everything is Googleable. Look it up and you'll see for yourself. And, uh, you know, hey, if you want to take that chance, you know, that's, that's on you. Don't do it to your kids. It's, it's not that hard. Just airplane mode uh, and keep it off your body. Thank you. I, I, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak. I, I truly hope that everything that, that you're doing and the things that I'm speaking of uh, do build momentum so that others are aware. Um, it's, this is a, a point where I feel like it's a, it's a true crisis. Sorry about that. I feel like it's it we're at uh, it's in epidemic proportions now. The amount of children that are are developing cancers at young ages, uh, young adults that are developing cancers, uh, myself included, 
Uh, I do feel that, you know, it is becoming an epidemic and I just want people to be aware. You know that um, in, in California, they issued an advisory educating people on how to reduce exposure to cell phones last year. They found that there were drafts going back to 2009. And more importantly, the drafts were for state employees to reduce exposure to cell phone radiation. And they also advised the employees to teach their children to when the employees went home to reduce exposure. And here's how. They talked about using beepers, uh, minimizing the use of the cell phone, how home cordless phones emitted radiation and that they should you know, keep those away or, or use wired phones. But they were for employees and their families, the original recommendations. And then it became redrafted, redrafted, and now it says, if you're concerned about cell phone radiation, here's how you reduce exposure. And there's some really solid recommendations, although there's a lot that has disappeared, actually, from the original recommendations that are incredibly important. I did not know that. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting chills. I, I literally have goosebumps learning about this from you right now. I'm not surprised. Um, I was not aware of that, and I don't understand. I don't understand. Well, I do understand. I, I believe that there are, are, are probably lobby groups from different industries uh, that benefit from us using these devices. Um, I don't understand how this can be kept so under wraps. I, I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sorry. It's... I'm sorry. Um, it's very upsetting to me. Uh, this is probably going to kill me. I'm not giving up. I'm not saying that. Um, it's upsetting. Um, it's upsetting. I'm, I'm angry. If nothing else, um, like I said, I'm, I've, I've had a wonderful life. I'm not ready to give up. But how could they go to sleep at night knowing that there are babies, babies, and I'm talking like two-year-olds, one-year-olds that are using these. How could anybody, how could anybody sleep at night knowing that this, these devices caused this and they just kept it, this information available to only a small group of, of government employees? I, I don't know how anybody can put their pillow, their head on their pillow at night and go to sleep knowing that. I look, I know that I'm not a scientist, but I know that the information that I've found has compelled me to spread the word to protect other people and children. And I I don't know that I, I could live with myself if I knew that and didn't spread the word. So to answer your question, what you just told me makes me sick and angry. I'm angry. I'm very angry. Yeah. That's what I have to say about that. <laughs> you know, my dad told me that when he was in the war, they would test mustard gas on the soldiers. Enough. En enough of us being guinea pigs. Enough. It's, you know, even if they're afraid that 1% of the population is not going to buy an iPad for their kid, so what? So many people, there's so much money to be made out there. There's so much, I mean, everybody has a cell phone. It's not like everybody's just going to throw them out and stop using uh, their laptops. Or I mean, look at me. In spite of everything that's happened, I, I, I still have this laptop. I don't put it on my leg, but I still have a cell phone. It's just about using it wisely, you know. Uh, I mean, they tell don't drink and drive, you know. Uh, you know, don't smoke cigarettes. It could, you know, kill you. It could cause cancer. Just if nothing else, slap a warning on it. Just slap a warning on 
how you can protect yourself and use these devices wisely. That's all that I want. I'm not saying to ban anything. I think all of us are in agreement. We're not asking for anything crazy like that. We just want awareness. I, I want there to be a warning. I want there to be a warning on, on, on the back of the cell phone box when you buy it or maybe on the cell phone itself. Definitely, you know, on, on the iPad boxes, but you just make it aware just how, you know, they put it on the cigarette packs. Uh, make me aware so that as an educated consumer, I can make my own decision. That's all mm -hmm. I want. I don't think that's too much to ask for. Just awareness. That's it. You know about the Berkeley Cell Phone Right to Know Ordinance? No, I do not. Oh, um, in Berkeley, well, actually, San Francisco passed a law that when you bought a phone, it would have on the packaging informing you that it emitted radio frequency radiation. And if you, it, it actually, it, it didn't say you must reduce exposure. It had recommendations on how to reduce exposure. Um, just as part of a, a precautionary approach, because San Francisco has a precautionary uh, way that they handle environmental issues. It's part of their, their policy. And they were sued by the wireless industry and weren't able to implement their law on that. But then Berkeley followed in 2015, and they passed an ordinance that says if a, you know, if a cell phone is turned on and in your pocket or bra, that it could emit radio, the amount of radio frequency radiation which can exceed government limits, which is exactly what the, the labeling says in the manual in the phone because cell phones and laptops, most laptops are not tested at body contact. They're tested at that distance. So the Berkeley ordinance just says mimicking what the phone actually says in the manufacturer's instruction booklet. They were sued by the wireless industry that it's violating retailers' free speech. And it's gone all the way to the Supreme Court, where it's in the midst of actually been thrown back to, the, to another court. But um, that there, Berkeley has passed that. And I'll say other countries already have that happening. But in the United States... Here's where we are. I, now that you, as you're speaking about it, at first I didn't, yes, I, I am aware of this. Okay. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I, I didn't recollect it at first. Yes, I, I am aware of that. Uh, I, it, it's mind blowing. I just, um, uh, you know, I remember growing up and uh, in social studies, you know, we learned about other countries and how they were propaganda and you know I, as, a, as a as a kid you didn't know what propaganda was and then you learned about well other countries they don't they don't they're not able to have news freedom of speech you know and we're very I love America I'm, I'm I, I love our country um, and I'm not saying that this is propaganda but how is this not I don't understand what more does it take how many more people have to die or or be physically deformed because of the surgeries that we have to have to, to remove these tumors? Uh, I, I don't understand it. And um, it's, it's not that it's propaganda because they're not coming out and saying, hey, cell phones are good for you. But sometimes an omission of saying something is just as, as bad as lying about something. Um, and I, I commend uh, the city of Berkeley for doing that. I just don't understand why it's on a local level and not on a federal level. Um, I, 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 there are so many things with the Environmental Protect Agency to protect our, our coral reefs and, and our environment. Uh, why is this not part of that. I mean, are we not as important as our environment, as our coral reefs, as our ozone layer? Are we not as or more important than that? So, you know, if we're going to talk about global warming uh, 
and uh, our environmental concerns, we make up the environment. We're part of the, we are part of this environment. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's important. I, I, I don't understand. And I, I, I am so compelled that I, I want, I want to go to Washington. I, I, I I, I want people, this is what I'm talking about. I want this to become something that people talk about. I want this to be, hey, did you know, did you hear about this? Or I, I want this to be a topic that people speak about. Uh, I love the environment. I, I, I used to love hiking. Um, I love the ocean. I, I care about our ocean. I, I want my grandchildren to see the beautiful coral reefs and the fish that are disappearing and there are so many groups uh clean ocean action there's so many environmental groups that i'm so you know happy that we have the environmental protection agency was actually working on safety limits for radiation from cell phones back in the 90s and <clears throat> They were going to create standards. You know, we don't have any safety standards in this country that are federally developed. And they were developing proper federally developed standards for the non-thermal effects the, and doing research on that. And they were, not only were they completely defunded, but they were told in a bill that was passed by Congress that they could not do any more research on the issue as on the eve of when they had, we have letters showing that they were saying, we are almost ready to release our limits. They were defunded in 1996, and that's when uh, the United States adopted guidelines from groups which are industry and military filled. Uh, the heads of these groups were industry, in fact, uh, we adopted those limits that they set, which don't protect for non-thermal effects, for, for long-term effects. There's not research, the research that they used didn't, it was on a lot of animals, small animals, and it was all short-term exposures, not long-term exposures, which is how we're exposed. You know, 1996 was 22 years ago. So much has changed. So many things have developed. How, so many new devices have become available. I mean, even iPads are, you know, what would you say, maybe the last 10 years, you know, uh, notebooks, those types of things. Um, so, so much has, has been placed on the market. And the fact that the guidelines that they're using are 22 years old, I just don't understand where where our priorities are. Um, I, I don't understand the secrecy. I, I, maybe I do, but I, I don't understand the secrecy. And again, you know, for the lobbyists, it's not like uh, people are going to just throw away their devices. That's not going to happen. Look at the cigarettes. I mean, granted, people know about it. They still smoke, unfortunately. But um, at, at least... Hopefully there are people that will take heed. I mean, they, they, you know, even as far as women, you know, drinking when you're pregnant or smoking when you're pregnant, um, you know, so those, those warnings have certainly created awareness and, 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 you know, stop people from doing these things, but the tobacco industry is still doing fantastic. So if any of these groups are afraid that they're going to lose business, which is crazy to me because a human life is worth, much more you can't put a dollar amount on it but if that's their concern don't worry about it because the the, the tobacco companies are still doing well so the law the, the the mobile device industry is not going to go anywhere they're not going to fold up because people all of a sudden stop using them i it just boggles my mind and and you know in a in a great country like ours where we do have freedom of speech and we are able to talk about things I'm, I'm blown away that this has not come to light sooner. That, that really is what really blew my mind. I do remember in the 90s when, um, when cell phones came out, um, 
And I do remember all the warnings about it. And, and I was talking to, to my niece, you know, she's only 31. And I said to her, I said, you know, I don't remember. I said, but you, you may be too young. I said, but when, when these, when the cell phones came out, there were huge warnings. People were afraid. People were like, oh, I'll never get one of those. Um, and she said, you know, you're right. I forgot all about that. She said, I completely forgot. And we all did. We, we all kind of forgot about it. You know, I always knew, and there was always little things here and there you would hear about the cell phones. Um, but you know, at the time I thought, well, I don't use it that much. Uh, you know, I really don't need to be concerned. Uh, but then you forget, you know, and then you're, you're, you're on the phone and, and then, you know, you're now we're our email. It's, it's now it's your alarm clock. Um, I, I would go to bed with my, my phone like on my pillow. And the funny thing is I know I'm not alone. There are a lot of other women that I work with that are like, oh my God, I, I do the same thing. Um, you know, sometimes I'll listen to like a meditation to help me fall asleep at night. It's my alarm clock. Um, you know, so as we became comfortable having these devices become, you know, everything for us, uh, we forgot. And then we weren't reminded. And then I think in the back of our minds, we're thinking, well, the government is monitoring this. <coughs> Excuse me. We're thinking the government is monitoring this, so they must be safe. <laughs> I have to laugh. I, 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 you know, I, I have to. It's it, it, it blows my mind. I'm just blown away by it. And I, again, I'm not being unpatriotic. Uh, I, I, I love my country. I'm grateful to 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 live in the United States of America, but it's about time. And this is not, I mean, this is not a partisan issue. This is not Democratic or Republican. This is a human, this is human. Um, and if other countries, and that's the other thing that amazes me, there are other countries that are more aware and have more awareness about this. And I always consider America the greatest country that we, uh, you know, our technology, we have, you know, created and done so many amazing things here. We have uh, so many intelligent scientists and uh, people. And I don't understand how the greatest country in the world, and I believe we are the greatest country in the world, is just dropping the ball on this. I, I'm, I, I will shout out to, to anyone, whether it's President Trump or or any of the other foreign presidents, any of our congressmen or senators, I'm going to give them a shout out and say, do something, do something. Um, Kim Kardashian was able to go to the White House and get the president to, uh, to give a woman par pardon who was in jail for a long time for a crime, and, and she was able to make him aware. I want him to be aware of this. I want our senators to be aware of this. And I don't want them to back down to the lobbyists. We're talking, we're all human. We all have husbands, wives, partners, children that use these devices. And I think first and foremost, we need to take care of ourselves we need to make this a priority. This is just as important as global warm, warming. That's what I will say. This is just as important, if not more, than global warming. I want this to be on top of everyone's minds, just the way that the Clean Air Act and, and the Clean Oceans, and, and I want this to be top of mind. This has to become top of mind. How many poor people have to die how many more people have to lose their leg or their lungs you know theodora when i was a runner i would run and i can't tell you it was so many times i would run and i would say thank you thank you for my legs and my lungs and i always thought if i ever lost this ability i don't know what i would do 
I lost half of my leg. I'm going to lose a little part of my lung on Monday. How much more is it going to take before our presidents, and I say that plural because I'm talking about who's in our office right now, who's to come, who was there before, how much longer is it going to take before it becomes a, a, a nonpartisan thing where we join together and do what's best for us, for the world, for humanity. This is not a United States thing. This is not a government thing. This is a humanitarian thing. Enough already, enough. And um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to get emotional. This is just very, I wasn't ready to have this happen to me. And I'm grateful, I've had a long life. I don't want this to happen. To, to someone younger that hasn't had a chance to have a full life like I have. Um, but it's time. Enough is enough. It's time. How many more people have to die before our government does something? I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for your courage and for telling your story because um, I, 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 I hope and pray that um, this video doesn't fall on deaf ears. I, I know there are going to be people, be people that are going to be like, oh, you know, she's hysterical. I don't care. Uh, I, I thank, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I will keep you posted on, uh, on my prognosis and uh, don't ever back down. We will not, I will not give up this fight. And that's what I'm going to say. Don't back down. Thank you.